Hello, everybody. Welcome to our studio show here in Latvia. It's round 12 of the FIA Motocross World Championship. And my guest today will be Jeremy Van Horbeek, uh, Jean-Michel Bale, and Robert Just, the local rider. And uh, always joining me here, Adam Wheeler from On Track Off Road. But before we get started with looking at some of the highlights from last week, Adam, um, as Roman Fever extends his lead in MXGP, finally we get news, Ryan Villapoto and retirement. Your thoughts, please. Big shame, isn't it? Uh, I think there was a lot of people who believed that he could have come back and at least raced the last two overseas events in Mexico and the USA just to, to close out a career. But I guess, you know, the cliche goes, if you're not committed to this sport, then, you know, it's, it's, it's really going to bite you. So Ryan obviously felt he couldn't race at the level he wanted to anymore and stepped away. I think it's, it's a big shame for the series. It's a big shame for everybody who follows the series. But, uh, you know, it's um, he's been missing for, what, five rounds now? Uh, so, or even more, I think. So yeah, it's it was uh, round four, wasn't it? Yeah, when he, when he had the injury. So I don't know. I think it's the news we were all kind of expecting. So it, in a way, it's kind of nice. It's confirmed now, and we're not thinking if he's coming back, when he's coming back. Um, so yeah, now we just have to move on and finish out the the championship. And in MX2, Jeffrey Hurling's picked up another injury last week. Um, not riding here this weekend. Again, thoughts on that? Yeah, Jeffrey's not riding here. I think mainly due to the risk of infection. Uh, it was an open wound rather than the actual injury itself. So, you know, he's going to be back in the Czech Republic in two weeks. And worst case scenario for him is that he sees a 78-point championship league cut down to 28 mm -hmm. if Tim Geiser can win both motos. Um, but, yeah, I mean, another injury for him. Mentally, it's going to be his toughest season ever. Uh, if he comes through winning the championship here, then, you know, it's going to feel immensely, you know, very satisfying. Well, before we uh, catch up with our first guest, Jeremy Van Horbeek, let's see what happened in Sweden one week ago. Here's some highlights from MXGP Race 2. MXGP race two. It was once again Roman Fevre who grabbed the Fox hole shot, but he ran wide on the exit of turn one, and Kevin Strybos snuck neatly up the inside. Christoph Charlier was buried though behind the number 11 of Philip Bankston. Cairoli had a better start this time, was in fifth, but then made this pass on Jeremy Van Horbeek to go fourth as he chased down Dean Ferris. Cairoli had a moment at the end of the straight, but was able to keep it upright. Charlie though, was having a battle on. Tommy Searle lasted a lap. Jose Boutron fell from 11th on lap two. And Dennis Ulrich also had troubles in race two. So did Christoph Charlie on the 24MX Honda. Tony Cairoli was battling on in third, but all eyes were on this battle for the lead between the 22 of Strybos and the 461 of Roman Fevre. Fevre sense an opportunity on more than one occasion. He stalled at this attempt, dropped back to about two seconds adrift of the Suzuki, and he thought it was all over at that point, just like it was for Charlie A. Rehearsal time for Fevre in the closing stages of the race. He wasn't able to pull that move off on the Suzuki rider, but a lap later, he got it absolutely perfect. Squared off the turn, went down the inside of Strybos, and with four laps to go, the Frenchman, Roman Fevre, was through. Couldn't quite shake off the challenge from the Suzuki, though, who was hounding him all the way. Tony Cairoli, damage limitation for him in the second race, but it was Fevre who was victorious in race two, making it a double race win here in Sweden. Strybos was second, Cairoli was third, and the podium looked like this. Fevre, Van Horbeek and Strybos, a Yamaha 1-2 here at round 11. And Fevre now leads the championship by 39 points over Cairoli, and Max Nagel has slipped to third. And after 11 rounds, it's all about Roman Fevre. Well, that was Sweden one week ago. And I'm um, pleased to say that our guest is here. He's been waiting all the time, actually. But we know him as Jeremy Van Horbeek from Yamaha Factory Racing, Yamaha Yamalu. But Lisa Leyland, our TV presenter, knows him as something else. <laughs> Check this. Jerry Mum, Jerry Mum, Jerry Mum, Jerry Mum. Jerry Mann. Jerry Mann. Jeremy Van Horbeek, congratulations. In uh, Maggiore in Italy after the qualifying race, Jerry Mann, welcome to our uh, studio show here. Um, round 11, it took you a while to get on the podium, didn't it? But yeah. um, where did it, you know, why is it taking you so long? Uh, where did it all start to go wrong for you in that respect? 
Oh, well, you know, um, after the perfect season last year, um, there was pretty much uh, some pressure from my side, you know, just uh, one position better is the world title. And um, I guess it was a bit too much for me, you know, and um, the riding was not smooth in the beginning, many crashes, hurt the foot afterwards. So, um, you know, the, it went all wrong. Um, and then after, you know, to come back always is, is, is not easy. After an injury, it's never easy. And, s and sh for sure on this level, it's, it's really hard because the, the level is the highest level uh, i ever seen. But then, you know, you start to feel comfortable uh, every weekend, uh, better and better. And finally, last weekend it happened. But still, the riding was not like I wanted to be. So it, it, there is still some progress, uh, but it it will take more time, you know. Like you say, it was a tough start to the season, but Trentino in particular, when you picked up that foot injury, wasn't that much of a crash, was it? No. Um, I mean, we, I think we had the crash, actually, yeah. uh, from Trentino. Just a very simple crash coming out of the left-hander. Yeah. No, the crash was not too bad, you know. It was just the, the bike landed on my foot, and uh, that was the thing, you know. I felt straight away something was wrong, and uh, yeah. And that was it. Just that was it. <laughs> and then, obviously, after that, you, you rode back to the truck, I guess, and yeah. had the diagnosis. Did the injury take longer than you thought it would to get over? Or was it a case of, right, the championship's done now and we just no, come back whenever? Um, the time of the injury, you know, was not so long. But when I could start riding again, you know, the, fo the foot was not feeling good. It was, like, still really painful, stiff and, and, and all that, you know. So it really took some more time. Uh, afterwards, you know, after I could start riding again, and and still now I I'm I'm painful in my big toe, so it doesn't disturb me so much uh, for riding, but it took really long after uh, when I started riding ag again. So, but uh, it is what it is, you know. The season is not over yet. Um, everything is still possible, uh, and and I feel good at the moment. So I will keep on grow growing in the in during the season. You Did know. it stop you from training? No, 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 no. But it was painful, though. Jeremy, one of the things I, uh, you know, saw from your season last year was how much you changed that Yamaha because it had a reputation of being a very fierce motorcycle, yeah. very powerful bike, um, and you you changed it around quite a lot. Uh, it obviously worked. Yeah. Uh, for this year, did you have to work equally as much on on the motorcycle, or you know, there was a couple of times when you didn't seem so happy with the setup? No, you know, I had to work a lot last year, and. Um, so the bike was was awesome and uh, also this year you know we had some small changes but uh i think uh, i took a bit the wrong direction you know in the winter you know some ideas that wa weren't the best ideas for me and um but sometimes you make mistakes you know I it's the rider's choice and uh the rinaldi team followed me and and, and trusted me and uh it was a bit of the, my mistake. I think uh, I took some wrong choices, and uh, now we are going back uh, the good direction. And uh, but but the biggest change was last year. This year was not a big big change. Mm. So I changed it a bit and uh, didn't work out so well for me. You know. Mm. And I guess from making those changes, I guess the reason why the the team trusted you so much is because even when you were suggesting things for last year's bike. The mechanics, because I, I spoke with them yeah. uh, in the media test in October, um, they were saying, you know, he asked for this and this, and we were like, we're not so sure no. about this direction, but then it worked for you. So maybe in the winter when you suggested those kind of changes for the new bike, they were like, okay, well, we know what he's, he knows what he's talking about, yeah. so we'll just go with it, but not the right decision in the end. Um, not 100%, you know, and... Um, now, you know, I have some new ideas, you know, and... and, and <laughs> <laughs> Save them for <laughs> next year. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and we're trying to work a bit to that direction, and it's going pretty well, you know. Also, I, th I think also Romain is trying those things now, and also him is liking it a lot. So, you know, we have a good bike. Uh, you can say uh, whatever you want. We have mm. a good bike, you know, so... Yeah. Um, I think the the worst years for, for Yamaha are, are over, you know, like uh, a few years back. And now, you know, it's been two years really, really successful. So I'm, I'm stoked for Yamaha, you know. How close are you to being the Jeremy Van Horbeck we saw in Lockett last year? You know, chasing Tony Cairoli down, forcing him into a mistake and taking that, that, that win. No, I, I, th I think I'm pretty close, you know. Um, Last last week was was really good already, but still didn't felt hundred percent comfortable. And also, you know, the heat is not my favorite thing, so I I, I have some some problems with that. Um, but uh, I think I'm pretty close. You know, maybe we can do uh, do it over in two weeks. Mm. We'll see.
Well, you started looking like you, uh, Jeremy Van Horbeek, of, of last year when we got to Majora, um, yeah. second in the qualifying race, third in race one. Yeah. Um, obviously, a great result for Yamaha as well on their 60th anniversary um, celebrations, you know, first, yeah. second and third, yeah. um, Roman, David and, and you. Um, how much of a relief was that for you to suddenly get back on the podium after the problems that you've had and after the success from last year? Ah, oh, you know, it's, it's it's always good, you know, like uh, to be back on the on the podium and 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 stuff. Uh, and I I knew I could do it, so um, you know, I was not worried worried about it. But it just had to happen. But I didn't know when. Mm -hmm. And then then I was pretty close. And then still, you know, there was some little mistakes, like uh, second moto in Majora uh, together with Bobochev in the start. Um, then uh, in Tuchental also second motor, you know, with waters we touched in the air and then had to come through the back again and same points, you know. So normally I had to be uh, more more on the podium already this year, but, you know, it is what it is. And that's why also last weekend I just didn't want to mess it up for my side, you know. And then, then I was steady in five, in fifth position and uh, I just stayed there and uh, because I knew I was on the <coughs> podium. So this week, you know, it's a different story. It happened. I'm, I was back on the podium. Um, I, I just gonna push till the end now. <laughs> <laughs> just looking outside yeah. our window, the rain <laughs> is absolutely hammering down <laughs> here. Um, but in Majora, obviously that was the first mud race. Did those conditions help you a little bit, um, given the fact that you maybe weren't 100% fit? Uh, no, really? you know it's, it's tough mud races, so it's also physical and, and mentally tough. So uh, to me, actually, it's not a big deal. It's, it's if it's mud or hard or sand, you know, I'm I'm an, an overall good rider mm. and. Um, also last year in, in Bulgari, it was raining a lot and I managed uh, second in the second motor. So I'm not scared when the rain is coming down, you know. It's it's not so nice for the for the people uh, for watching. and uh, But for me, it's not a big deal, you know. Best weekend of the year, though, certainly last week in Sweden. Uh, first and second, you and, uh, and Roman. Yeah. Um, and the first time on the podium overall. Yeah. Um, just tell us briefly about that. Yeah, you know, like uh, like I said, the uh, first motor was, was uh, really good. Really, really good. Uh, I was second and uh, didn't try to push uh, to win the race, you know, because I was feeling good in second position. And then uh, second motor, you know, there was a lot of water on the track, and uh, I was I knew when I uh, when the the standings were staying like that, you know, like uh, in fifth position, I would take uh, the podium overall. So I didn't want to try to take a risk to pass uh, the, the riders in front of me because I tried on Saturday and then. We went both down, me and, and Dean, uh, because we touched each other. So, you know, to me it was good to finally have that podium. And uh, like I said, now uh, I'm just going to try to pick it up because it's done. You know, this year I did it and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready. Almost out of time, but real quick. Are yeah. you surprised at um, Roman's performances this year? And how do you guys get along? As teammates, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a big surprise for for me, and I think for everybody. You know, he's a he's a rookie, and uh, you know, his his first year. Uh, it's never easy to come to the big class and uh, and and do it, especially this year. You know, so uh, we're good friends. You know, we we don't have problems. Uh, we just say hello and 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 we do every every our job, our own job. So we we don't have uh, we don't have troubles uh, in the team. So it's it's good. You know. Good job. Well, look, Jeremy yeah. Van Horbeek, or Jerry Mann, as uh, he's yeah, now going to be known. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on the studio show and Thank all the you. best this weekend for the rest of the season as well. Thanks a lot. Right, before we meet our next guest, here's what happened in MX2 in Sweden. Highlights from race two coming up in a moment, but there was more drama involving Jeffrey Hurlings. Well, Jeffrey Hurlings might have made it through race one unscathed, but race two turned out to be a completely different story altogether. Hurlings looked poised and ready to go, just like he was in race one. He made a decent jump as well, but it was Jeremy Siwa on the Rockstar Energy Suzuki who pulled the foxhole shot. He ran a little bit wide on the exit of the turn. And then Jeffrey Hurlings, well placed in third, got it all wrong on the exit. The back wheel came around on him and high-sided him to the ground. He bit the dirt hard, picked himself up and realized immediately that there was a problem with the left hand. And in particular, the little finger. He ran immediately to the medical centre. Meanwhile, the race continued. Tixier led, but not for long. As Jeremy Siewert found his way past 
the defending champion. And almost immediately, Tim Geiser followed suit once more. On lap three, though, Geiser charged down the inside of the Swiss rider and took the lead at the top of the hill. From then on, Geiser was in control. Paul's Jonas on the KTM was well placed in fourth, but had this spectacular moment. His world came crashing to an end. On lap 10, he picked himself up and was able to walk away, but he and the bike were more than a little bit secondhand. Sever Bruljakov was once more having a great ride on his JTEC Honda, finding his way past Julian Lieber in the early stages of the race. Valentin Gio, after a poor start, found himself charging hard in the second race. First of all, passing his teammate despite a bent gear lever, he then went after the 18 of Sever Bruljakov to get himself into fourth. But Tim Geiser raced to his third victory of the season, but more importantly, his fourth overall Grand Prix win of the year, ahead of Gio and Siwa, the two Swiss riders on the podium for the first time together in MX2. Jeffrey Hurlings continues to lead the championship by 78 points now over Geiser and Gio with Siwa now fourth. <laughs>so that was sweden uh, just one week ago tim geiser picking up another grand prix victory in mx2 for honda and uh hrc sporting manager joins me now jean michel bell now for the younger viewers that might not know who he is uh, this guy he really is a legend of the sport um a 125 and 250 cc world champion 88 89 went to the us won pretty much everything within the two years that he was there um including the ama 250 supercross championship outdoor and 500 cc uh, motocross uh, championship before going into road race and having a, a pretty successful career there including two pole positions in the 500 cc category um jean-michel bell welcome to our studio show uh, the first time we've had you on the studio show on mxgp tv um just Covering the career there, are you happy with how everything turned out for you as a rider in all uh, disciplines? Oh, you always hope better, you know. You're always trying, um, you know, to reach the, the top in uh, every race, every every year, every season. Uh, but I feel like I did um, everything I can. I, I feel like I give in more than 100% all the time. So I feel happy with it. And how was that journey to America? Because we've seen riders since go over there from Europe. Um, some have been successful, some not so. Um, what was it like for you as a rider making that transition? Uh, of course, it's a two different world. Uh, you know, uh, at this time, you know, the American rider was uh, dominating the world of motocross. So it was very important for me to be a world champion in Europe and to show them then, uh, you know, uh, European rider was, was able to ride also in Supercross. So that's why I went over there, and of course it was not easy the first year. <laughs> uh, was was that yeah. because of the language and the, uh, the, the difference Every, in cultures? Everything, you know, the, the, the way of living, uh, the language. The, uh, I was the first one, you know, to come over there, so for sure it was difficult. And, uh, and the racing also, because I was world champion, but um, I didn't finish my two first Supercross. So it was quite difficult, but um, the end was uh, very nice. And I showed them then uh, we were able to ride as fast as they are able to ride. Do you think the level now between Grand Prix in the US is maybe closer than it's ever have, has been? Yeah, of course. Of course. Big big change since, uh, I think, five years now. Mm. Uh, because the track in Europe are very different. They get, um, you know, more close to, to Supercross. We have a jump, we have wave. Uh, so I think the European riders are getting very, um, very good at this too. So now the it's very, very close, I think. When you left motocross to go to World uh, Road Race Championship, which is now MotoGP, um, when you finished your career there, did a little bit of um, enduro, and then you, we never really saw you around the, the motocross paddock, certainly in the World Championship. Did you kind of fall out of love with the sport for a while, or was it you just needed to take a back seat? Um, where did you disappear to? What were you um, doing? You know, I, I love motorcycle. You know, from I started trial bike when I was young, and after I raced motocross. Uh, my first goal was to race road race. But at this time, I was not able to ride road race at 12 years old. So I, s I went to motocross and everything went very good. So I keep going. But in my head, my goal was to ride road racing and to be a road racing champion. So that's why as soon as my career in motocross was enough for me, I, I went to road race. But my love go to all motorcycle sports. So I was away from motocross. 
I agree. But I was following, and I still love it, you know. I, and I still love road racing also, and I still like trial. I went last year to the Grand Prix trial in uh, Corsica, you know, mm. to just watch the race. So I love motorcycles. So of course, you know, I'm happy to to be back in the paddock. Uh, it feels a little bit like uh, my home, you know. Mm. I d I don't feel like I was very far away. How did the the return back to motocross come about? Because I remember seeing you in Lockett maybe two years ago, three years ago, and then last year we saw you a little bit more, mm -hmm. and now here you are, sporting manager. You've always remained close to your roots at Honda. Um, so how did the whole deal come about to get you back with HLC and working with uh, the MXGP team? Well, when I stopped racing uh, road race and endurance, um, I ride a little bit enduro just for fun. Uh, I was close to Honda in Europe, close to Honda France for um, some PR stuff and some uh, riding with a bike. More in roadways than motocross, but I was in a contact with motocross. And um, yeah, you know, I just came to some race and talked to the team and, you know, everything was going okay. And we tried to, to, to work on this year, you know, and, um, you know, I tried to make a Gautier Poulain sign for Honda and we make the deal. and. Uh, uh, you know, HRC was very happy about that, so they, they, they want me also to work in a team. So, you know, everything came together at a good time, so it was uh, it was good for me. And also for me, Honda is HRC for me. It's like, uh, you know, already racing for them was something very big. Uh, I never raced for them in the road race. That's my, you know, mm. worst, <laughs> worst thing <laughs> because the bike was uh, very good. Uh, but, uh, you know, my heart is for, for Honda and HRC. So uh, for me, it's no question I work for them and I will never work for somebody else. I can see that in your face now mm -hmm. when you when you say yeah. it's almost emotive. Yeah, I've been, you know, racing for them and working for them. It's the uh, same feeling. You know, it's just great. How are you finding doing a full season, you know, for the first time since you've been racing, you know, every Grand Prix and having that timetable and that traveling commitment? How's that all working? This is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> this is difficult, but, you know, I, I love what I'm doing, you know, and when I do something, I do always uh, 100%. Mm. And uh, I know when you want to do something, is um, not always easy. You have to work hard, and uh, this is part of the job. And uh, if I want to have the, the, the good time, I need to have the bad time also. So I understand it, and I do with it. I mean, I know, Paul, you want to ask a little bit about how you're working with, you know, Evgeny and Gautier, but I remember doing an interview with you earlier in the year, and mm -hmm. you said that, you know, being away from racing helped you get more of an outside perspective on, on it and how it works and, and maybe how to be better and to improve. So, um, you know, through your work now, you know, that time away was, was valuable, wasn't it? Yes, of course. Of course, but because when you are always in racing, you are a little bit your head down and you don't look around. But when you are away and, you know, I did many different sports, road race and everything. So now for me, it's a little bit more easy to understand the, the picture, you know, from a little bit behind. So, you know, it's I, I, I think it was it, it was good to be away a little bit to to have a, to be able to help them in a good in, in good way. Talk of the riders then, uh, Gautier Paul and, and Evgeny Bobashev. Um, Bobby, first of all, um, what's it like working with him? Um, how have you been able to improve him as a rider uh, this year, do you think? And what's he like to work with? Uh, of course, you know, with, uh, with Bobby and with Gautier, we have two different styles, you know, completely different, opposite. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very different, for sure. Uh, Bobby was have a lot of injury last year, so it was difficult for him, you know, for the beginning of the year. So we tried to, to make him, I tried to make him confident, try to uh, get back, you know, you know, just fun, you know, have, have fun at riding the bike and uh, uh, trying to have fun on a GP. Don't really care about the, the, the position, uh, you know, beginning of the year, it was, you know, around seven place all the time. But, you know, I always try to, to be positive with him and to just to try to make him happy. And, um, you know, I'm surprised because everything is, is so fast now. Mm. You know, he's got to be a little bit more in control uh, because now, he, you know, I don't want him to go more fast. I just want him to be more controlling everything. Mm. So he, he avoids some, some mistake. Maybe this was his problem in the past. Yeah, mm. because he was giving so much to racing. Then when you give, you know, all the way more than 100%, for sure you make some mistake. Mm. But uh, sometimes you have to ride 80%. You know, you, you, you have to. If you want to keep, you know, all season long, all race, uh, you have some time to attack and sometimes you have to, to be a little bit behind. Mm. So that's my job. I try to make him, you know, more, more in control of, of what he's doing. And what about Gautier? Because um, obviously 
signing for HRC for him was a big move, big mm -hmm. step, maybe a big uh, price tag on the shoulders as well. Comes with a little bit of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen glimpses, moments of his uh, brilliance, what he can do, but it's not always been there, has it? It's been a little bit of up and down. Um, Again, how is it working with him, um, and how do you think his season has gone? Where do you think things have been a little bit off for him? Yeah, like you say, it's uh, very up and down. Mm. Um, you know, Gauthier, we know that he's able to ride the bike. He's able to do some sometimes incredible stuff on a, on a track. That's uh, We are sure about it. Uh, for him, it's a big change because he race, uh, his uh, old team was a little bit his team. Mm. You know, he was taking care of everything and... Uh, now, for sure, working for HRC is quite different, you know, because um, it's very uh, Japanese way of working, you know, it's very strict. But uh, I think for me, it's the best solution to reach the top level. Uh, so he's, uh, he's getting used to it. Uh, also, he's getting used to the bike, to the way we are working on a bike. Uh, like you say, it's a little bit up and down, and uh, we try to to make him, you know, a little bit more, you know, uh, trying to make every week there. And... Uh, we are working on it, of course. I think with Evgeny, we've seen a definite improvement. I mean, he's been consistent compared to the last mm. year. It's like you say, a little bit more in control. Uh, but with Gautier, it's been a different kind of season because in the past, he's won Grand Prix and we've marveled at what he can do on the motorbike. But then this year, maybe he's missing just one or two Grand Prix of really better results. But other than that, he's still in there for the championship. I mean, he's not far away. Yeah, like you say, he's very... He's, he's there, he's there, but um, he needs a little the light, you know, the light to be always in top front and in the top three. And, um, you know, right now it's not, uh, yeah, like you say, it's up and down. So, you know, I'm working on it. I try to make him, you know, uh, better and I think he's, he's trying to. So, you know, it's, um, he's doing his best and, you know, I try to help him and the team is doing the bike. So we all work together and uh, we, we're going to get better. Well, one guy who is doing very well is obviously the guy who's leading the championship, Roman Fevre, another Frenchman. Mm -hmm. um, are you surprised by what he's doing this year? Um, really, you know? yes. Yeah. Yes, really, yeah. Because um, uh, first, you know, I saw some good, some good result, but you know, you always can say, "Oh, he's lucky," or you know, something happened. But he's not lucky. He's riding very good the bike, you know. And I'm, I am on a racetrack, you know, every week, you know, everyone, every practice, and I check everything, and uh, he's riding very good on the bike. He doesn't make so many mistakes. So, yeah. And now he's very confident. You know, he's leading the championship. So, yeah, he's a very good rider. Um, we are running out of time with you, Jean-Michel. Um, but obviously this week or two days ago, it was announced Ryan Villapoto decided to announce his retirement. Um, as a guy who has retired through injury um, mm -hmm. from road race, um, what are your thoughts on his decision to uh, leave the sport now? Yeah, it's not a problem of you know, injury or not, it's the, t it's the way a little bit of thing is happening, you mm. know. Um, uh, Ryan came to Europe, you know, it's, you know, I think already coming to Europe and saying then his last year of racing, I think it was a little bit, you know, uh, not so good for the, he, you know, I, I'm sure in his head he thought he was going to go to the World Championship, take the title and, uh, you know, retire. Mm. Uh, for me, it's a lot of pretension to say that because uh, European riders are quite very good. So, and the uh, racing capital race, uh, I was very happy with what he does because you know I did the same the other way. So I was when he when he says that I was so happy. I, and I, when he won in Thailand, I was the first one to check his hand to say good job because I was happy for him mm. because uh, we all like racing and we want to see good racing and uh, of course to see Ryan there was very important. But um, I'm, you know, it, he, he crashed in Italy and we have no news for two months and now he said then he quit and, you know, I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, I think it's, um, I don't know exactly what he have, his injury. We don't know. Nobody know. Mm. Uh, so I'm a little bit surprised about this. And nobody's so. speaking about it either. Would yeah. you have preferred then he, if it, if it was possible, to, to return to the track to finish the last two or three GPs and, and go out? maybe on the podium in that respect? Well, the last two GPs, the last GP is in the uh, US, so it's in Glenehan. So, you know, I think for him, you know, racing there, uh, maybe maybe do, maybe do a podium and mm. say bye-bye to the motocross world. It was a good way to do it. Uh, but we, we don't know exactly what the injury situation is. Mm. Uh, the problem is we, d we don't exactly know. So, you know, it's like we are here and we, d we don't know exactly. Mm. Um, before you go, um, 
there was just a mention of um, a guy on Twitter, um, PS459. He said, JMB is the GOAT, the greatest of all time on two wheels, in his opinion, um, winning both the AMA and World Championship titles and then going into road racing, MotoGP as it is now. We won't see another Jean-Michel Bale. You're a hero in his eyes, but we won't, will we? We won't. I don't think we'll see somebody do what you've done in motocross for five minutes, disappear to road race, where actually you maybe spent more time as a pro racer in road race than you did in, uh, in motocross uh, and was successful there. Yeah, but you know that's my my way of of, of life. Mm. You know, I like a challenge. Uh, I I like to work hard to make my my dream come true, and that's the way I am. And um, of course, you know, uh, for me, it was easy to stay in a motocross or supercross and to make many seasons. But uh, this is how not how I get happy every day. Uh, I need to wake up to do something, you know, and I need to wake up with goal. And um, even today, when I am working for RTRC and for uh, my two rider, you know, it's the same thing. You know, when I wake up, I know why I'm waking up. I try to, to bring the team to the World Championship. And uh, so it's just a challenge, you know. And of course, going from motocross to road race was a big change, but it was in my head already. So, you know, I cannot, I cannot do without it. Yeah. Well, it, um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show with us this weekend. Um, all the best with uh, what you're doing now as sporting manager at HRC. And uh, who knows, maybe uh, one of your guys will be standing on the top step of the podium this weekend. Yeah. Jean-Michel Bale. Um, right, it's time to meet our next guest. But before we do, um, here's a chance to win with Get Athena. Right, so our Get Athena competition, um, as it was at the beginning of the season, Take a picture at the MXGP race showing the Athena or Get logo. Upload the picture with the hashtag MXGP or hashtag Athena live on the MXGP Facebook page. And the most voted for picture at the end of the day will win a uh, OGO backpack. And obviously the winner then will proceed to the next stage of the competition. The top three during the race season will qualify for the 2015 uh, Athena photo competition. And after the motocross the nations, the finalists will go to head to win more fantastic prizes, including two VIP passes to MXGP, a race of your choice in 2016. There'll be a GoPro prize, of which I'm not sure, and an OGO prize as well. So good luck with that. And don't forget to post your pics on the MXGP Facebook page. Uh, or more information, just go to our website, mxgp.com, and like us or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, don't forget, we still have our mid-season sale going on as well on MXGP TV that's offering a 50% discount on our season pass, which also includes the FIM Monster Energy Motocross of Nations. Right, our final guest is in place now, uh, Robert Just, HSF Logistics Motorsport. Uh, welcome to our studio show, the first time for you as well. And this is very much your home race, isn't it? If, we, if I was to fly a drone cam with a GoPro on it now to your house over the trees here, Two kilometers, three kilometers, maybe? Yeah, around that, like, I think three kilometers. Just over the lake? Yeah. Yeah? So this is very much a home race for you? Yeah, that is, that's true. Nervous? Yeah, for, like, <laughs> so much stress before the free practice. I couldn't ride smooth and, like, yeah, I put too much on myself, so. Already in practice? Yeah, but I think it's coming better now because, you know, first practice is always, like, difficult. Also, last year in Nations was going bad and then every practice getting better. What about um, your season so <coughs> far? 15th in the championship standings. The only rider to have scored points in every moto, <laughs> which is uh, pretty impressive anyway. Um, but this is turning out to, your, to be your best season, isn't it? Yeah, for sure it is. Like, um, like all season long, I'm having good starts. Like, uh, most of the starts are top 10 starts. And, uh, and, yeah, that's the most important thing. And then I just keep... Uh, keep my sp my own speed and don't push too hard like over the limit and don't try to make stupid mistakes and finish all the races so what do you think has been the difference between this year and the seasons before yeah this year i i've worked uh, much harder with john van der berg in spain uh, with the three month uh, training camp and then with john van der berg yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah and also the team is more professional you know and and the bikes are a little bit better than than the years before, and uh, it's like uh, from amateur team to to professional team, you know. Mm, because you were riding for the Latvia Elchni team, weren't you? Before, um, did that seem more like a, a family-based team that was just an introduction into into racing? And now, almost even though it's not a factory team, you feel 
like you're a factory rider and the level of uh, professionalism and the expectation is maybe a bit higher yeah for sure last year's last year's they did the like great job they did everything they could like uh, the ma the best bike they could they make and uh it w i was feeling more like in like in family and uh but uh, the budget was not so so high so when i came to hsf then everything was different you know and i didn't need to do some extra things what the usually rider don't need to do so so it's much easier for me i mean you know this is your home grand prix um you know we've seen some latvian riders like paul jonas matis caro come through to the world championship i think the first grand prix we here was 2006 mm -hmm. 2007 with an mx3 i think and then yeah. 2009 for mx uh, mx1 so MX2. having the world championship visit latvia every year has that helped you you know as kids as young riders to, to come up to a good level and be grand prix riders yeah for sure because like uh like many kids don't go out of Latvia to ride there and they see the highest level here and then they are like just dreaming to to be a professional and otherwise they don't don't see this and and uh yeah I think for sure more more riders is coming for because of this race and uh and uh, yeah it's it's putting motocross in Latvia higher than, than before. FIM Junior World Championship was here in 2004, wasn't it? I think Zach Osborne won. Yeah. Um, did you come to the race? Did you watch? Were you racing? Uh, I was uh, I was still riding 65. I was watching the race. And uh, yeah, I remember he won like, like he was, I was like fan of him. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But even then at that early introduction on the 65, you're looking and thinking, wow, an FIM Junior World Championship yeah. in Latvia. Uh, yeah. Fast guys from all over the world. Um, did you ever think you would be a part of the, the show? Yeah, that that time I was thinking like, oh, they are so fast, and I I could never be like that. But yeah. now I'm coming there, and like, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Well, one of the okay, we have two standout performances from you. Uh, the first one in France, where suddenly you were up the front, first race, um, made a great start. Um, I think you took your first top ten finish, ninth in uh, race one, I think it was. Um, what was it like racing with the guys like Tixier and, uh, and Hurlings and Guillo and Geiser? Because um, normally you're not that far up the field. And I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. It's just that the last two yeah. years or three years that you've been in MX2, we've never seen you so far up the field. So how was that suddenly for you? Like, man, I'm in the top 10 here. Actually, the, the first laps are way easier because nobody is like, uh, like, hitting you or <laughs> they try to pass smooth you know but they're back in the pack about 20 plays they just go wide open and like hitting each other and for the uh, uh, for the riders or the viewers at home who don't know um which one robert is is the guy in the white in the hsf logistics it's very uh distinctive clothing from that team isn't yeah. it everything white but um we see tixier disappearing and then here you are behind uh, david herberto at the moment but you know tonkov behind you and guys are just ahead of you or whatever and um you know was the even though you say the the riders aren't hitting you like they are in the mid pack. Yeah. How was the pace at the front? Was it pretty fast those first few laps and difficult to stay there? Yeah, it was quite difficult, you know. But uh, if you make a small mistake, then they are they are uh, like pass and gone already. If you don't make any mistakes, then you, I can keep the like the same a little bit the same speed as they do. So yeah, the big mistakes make me slower, you know, like. Mm. If the, if I'm on the wheel of the other rider, like faster rider, then I can keep like with them, and then if I make like small mistake, then they are a little bit gone, and then they go away. Like so, that know. was a top nine finish. What was the goal before the start of the season with the new team? Um, actually, goal was to to my goal was to score points um, every GP and uh, to be like to ride around 15 place, 15 maybe a few top tens, and mm. it's working good now. So obviously that was mission accomplished in that race. But then in Sweden last week, you had your first ever top 10 overall. You finished eighth overall. Um, that must have been a, another thing in your mind where you go, OK, yeah. now I'm a top 10 rider. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, but like yeah, every race is different. Some Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes not. But uh, yeah, for sure, I feel now more than more more higher level than before. And uh, my, I have a confidence that I can ride top 10 and feel good about that again uh, how were the circuit conditions here last week and uh, what was it like racing there again at the front at the sharp end um, inside the top 10 um i i really didn't like that track so much no. like i was it, it's the for me it's worst track on the calendar in the gps <laughs> 
And then, uh, yeah, first Saturday I was feeling like uh, really bad, didn't riding didn't go so well. And then uh, uh, Sunday with a, with a good start, you know, I was up there and then I saw the other guys' lines and, and the speed and then it was way easier, you know, to, to, uh, to be in front. Talking of tracks, sorry, Paul. I mean, this place here, Kegums, is a bit of a strange place, isn't it? It can be sandy, but it can also be rock, rock hard. It's, uh, you know, some strange bumps as well. Yeah, it's quite sketchy, you know. It's like on top it's sand, and then uh, uh, on the bottom there is like uh, some bumps, like kicky bumps, and, you know, you get... It can surprise you any time, and uh, you have to be careful in this track. Just finally, because uh, we are out of time, I know it's your home race. I know you were a little bit nervous in practice this morning, but are you looking forward to it, really? Yeah. Especially with the, posi the, the positions that you've had, the results that you've had, the last couple of races. Not putting more top 10 <laughs> pressure on <laughs> No, anyway, no, Paul. no. But, you know, maybe <laughs> now that you've kind of, you've realised you've stepped it up a level. So you now have, along with Paul Jonas, um, something to offer yeah. uh, the fans. Yeah, actually, I want to just to keep it uh, to keep it not yeah. not too high expectations and just to to do my my thing just like other GPs and to not to make stupid mistakes, you know, to push too hard or to go over the limit. I just want to keep it like uh, the same as other GPs. All right. Well, uh, Robert Jess, thanks for joining us here. First time on the studio show for you. We didn't want to do a Todd Waters on him and give him some <laughs> like initiation ceremony, but <laughs> JMB <laughs> as well. Yeah. I didn't bring that no, one no, up. No, 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 no. <laughs> Where they would have to sing it. But uh, but thanks for joining us here this weekend thanks. and all the best at your home Grand Prix. Well, that's it for another studio show this week. Round 12 is just around the corner. In MX2, of course, Tim Geiser will be looking into real Jeffrey Hurlings, who is not here, so the lead could be down to just 28 points in the MX2 standings. And in MXGP, well, if any, if it's anything like what we've seen in uh, recent Grand then anything could go here. So hope you can join us tomorrow. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then. Bye.